<clears throat> this little video lecture is going to try and give you all an idea of what's going on in what will be the United States um, when Hector St. John de Quebecois is writing these letters from an American farmer. Okay. Um, so yeah, the purpose of this is just to look at who is this guy, number one, and what's going on when he's writing. I'm also going to go over some of the major vocabulary words that you're going to need to talk about uh, for your quiz and for your eventual speech. So we had this, uh, this letter, right? And actually, we only have an excerpt here. Um, what is an American? And you can see this is the same kind of sheet that we're going to give you in class, looking at, you know, the real awesome, you know, applicable stuff um, that we're going to talk about. What is an American? Right? What does this mean? Keep in mind, America, I, you know, doesn't necessarily exist fully at this point. It's 1782. Um, you know, we, the erstwhile United States has been fighting the revolution now for seven years. The Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776. So there is an independent entity that is the United States. But America has not been defined yet. We don't have a constitution yet. We have Articles of Confederation, which are a loose kind of binding of all the colonies together, mostly in a military alliance. But, you know, we have this guy, Hector St. John de Quebecois, who's trying to figure out what is an American. And really, he's helping Americans figure this out for themselves. This is not something that's already been, like, figured out and, and written down somewhere. So who is this guy? Um, so we can check out Wikipedia if you want. You guys can read all of this if you want a, like a really, really good you know, 360 degree view of, of who this guy is. But what you want to know is he's, he's actually really rich. And as you can probably tell by his name, he's French. He lived in New France um, in the 1750s. Um, and he you know, basically is a, a victim of a lost war, the French and Indian War, um, in the mid uh, 1760s, 1756 to 1763. So he loses, Britain wins, Britain takes over all of uh, New Canada, or New France, which is Canada, and he has to leave. What's crazy is that he used to be an enemy, and he ends up moving to the British colonies, specifically New York. Um, he becomes a citizen, a British citizen, and he changes his name to John Hector St. John, and he marries um, an American woman who would be, who would be British, Mehitable Tippett, all right, a daughter of a New York merchant, Okay, and he buys a farm. So we have a French citizen, loses a war, and you would think he would just go back to France. After all, he is super rich. But no, he moves to this, these new kind of colonies. He stays in Britain, and he ends up marrying, you know, up and gets a farm, right? And he farms for a long time. And by, by farming, I mean he manages a farm, right? Don't think that super rich people are farming. <laughs> he's managing other people who farm. Um, and he's making quite a bit of money. He does pretty well for himself. So he, you know, it, he's a learned gentleman. This is the middle of the Enlightenment. Um, and so he's more concerned about ideas and progress and framing things scientifically. Um, and that's what he does in his letters. Now, there's a whole bunch of letters, and you can actually see the outline on Wikipedia. There's um, 12 of them. And you can even go and see some of these letters here. Um, you can read them all if you want. There's lots of really good stuff in there if you want to kind of learn about life in the late 18th century, late 1700s. But, you know, he sits down and writes these letters. He's, he's actually in France when he writes them. Or, sorry, when he publishes them. He, he kind of had written them through the 1760s and 1770s as he's figuring out what it means to be in these newly formed United States. Um, and especially as it goes to the Revolution, he's trying to make sense of how He's going to define both his place and like what the American place is. Okay, keep in mind America's really, really diverse. So it has a bunch of different ethnic groups. It is a British landholding, but as you can see through this map, all right, all of the colonies, all the way up from Massachusetts, which includes Maine at this point, all the way down to Georgia, are a mix of different groups: African, Dutch, English, German, Scotch, Irish, and Scots. Swedish and Welsh. So America's always been a very, very diverse country in the fact that it's made up of a bunch of other national nationalities, mostly from Europe, right? The one um, exception being African, which of course were all slaves, although there are some free blacks, both in the North, especially in the North and some in the South, actually. So America's always had this diversity, 
which we just don't see in Europe. Europe, if you live in France, you're French. If you live in Britain, you're British. If you live in Germany, actually Germany isn't really a country, it's kind of a collection of different kingdoms, but you are considered, you know, Saxon, or you are considered Norman. If, well, sorry, that's in, actually in French. Sorry, if you were live in Bavaria, you'd be Bavarian, right? Schleswig-Holstein. You'd be a Schleswig-Holsteiner. So there's a lot of, at least in Germany, a bunch of different little kingdoms, but it's still Germanic. They're Germanic people, and they consider themselves kind of together, at least ethnically. Okay? So we have this really diverse new area, okay? Quebecois settling in New York, right? And actually, there's a bunch of Dutch influence there. The Dutch actually settled most of the Hudson River Valley. That's why New York was actually called New Amsterdam at one point. But Crevacois is trying to figure out how do we join all of these diverse groups of people together into one body, into one group of people that all fight for the same things. And that's what we're going to be doing in class, looking at this reading. What does that mean? And he asked this question, what then is the American, this new man? Right? He is either a European or the ascendant of a European. All right? And we're going to go over all of this in class and tease this out and analyze it. But I at least want you to know, diversity is present, okay? Especially as we go through the American Revolution, all right? And the, the, colon, uh, the people who live in the colony start to protest, right? We have things like the Boston Massacre that happened. British soldiers kind of accidentally fire and kill five I guess you could call them Americans, right? But they're really just citizens of Boston. Okay, lots of protests will come out. And once again, Crevacar is trying to, to Crevacar rather, is trying to tie together kind of a, you know, a unifying bond for all of these people. Keep in mind too that most of the governments in Europe, if not all of them in Europe, are monarchies, all right? So kings rule, democracy, which is what America is gonna end up being founded on, is new, right? America will not be a pure democracy. It never has been a pure democracy, but it's built on democratic ideals, mostly written about by French philosophers like Voltaire, Rousseau. We get some John Locke, John Locke, who's British. Okay, so, you know, monarchies, all right, are a European thing. In the colonies, we have a lot of self rule, which therefore is more democratic, right? Democracy is defined as the ability of a group of people to decide for themselves what is best for themselves. By a majority vote. Okay, so if you know you have a hundred people and fifty-one people think that something should happen, then it happens. That's democracy, okay, where the majority rules. All right. So America is kind of teasing out these democratic ideals where the majority can rule, and that therefore kings can't rule. And we settle on this idea of a republic, which is really where we elect representatives to go and kind of create a government for us. So we don't have monarchy, you know, one person deciding everything. We don't have democracy, which is where the majority decide everything. What we have is kind of a combination of both in some ways, where in America, the different colonies are going to end up electing representatives to go and decide things for them, right? So we have constitutional conventions in the late 1780s, even the, you know, the Declaration of Independence and the Continental Congresses during the American Revolution. We have representatives meeting. We don't have, you know, this massive, massive you know, groups of 50,000 people descending on Philadelphia to write the Declaration of Independence. Okay, so America, though, or would-be America, is experimenting with democratic ideas. And no one else has done this yet. So it's very, very brand new. And Krebikov is aware of all this. Okay, and so that's why he writes these letters, kind of promoting reconciliation and kind of defining, once again, what it means to have this new democracy, this new republic of experience. As you know, America fights um, the revolution, 1775 to 1783. And really, with the aid of the French, they are able to win. Without the French, we would have never won this war. They help pin, the French help pin the British um, at Yorktown, preventing them from retreating on water. Um, you know, and it's, the American Revolution is one of those wars where we kind of over romanticized today. It was pretty ugly. There were a lot of deserters. Not everyone who lives in the United States or the colonies at this point is either a supporter of George Washington and the Patriot cause or of the crown. 
most people are actually what we call fence sitters. They just kind of hang out and watch what's going on, which is actually true in the United States today. Most people just kind of wait and watch and see what's going on. But as we can see through the fighting of the, of the revolution, and this actually is a painting of Washington crossing the Delaware in 1851, so much, much later. Um, you know, there, there's this idea the seed of an idea that we need to define what it is to be an American. Um, and so the American Revolution, of course, grants us our freedom from the crown. Um, we get all of these colonies. Let me go back to my colonial map. Whoop. And actually all the land going west, um, all the way back to what will be the Mississippi River. So it's actually a massive land grab too. Um, so you know, as the war ends, and that's when Krebacar is writing, in 1782, we've got to decide, and we got to decide quick, what it means to be an American. If we don't, then we got a bunch of land that might, I don't know, split off and become another country, or be gobbled back up by the British. So there's a lot at stake here. And so Pepper helps to speak into that. Um, so yeah, he writes in 1782. A little bit more background for Prebequa. He actually ends up going back to France. He dies in France. Um, kind of settles on his own estate over there that he eventually ends up inheriting. So it's kind of interesting. You know, we have this French citizen um, that doesn't live in America that long. Um, he's French, but he's supportive of the Patriot cause, but not overly supportive. So he's kind of like in the right place at the right time, and he's asking the right questions, right? What does it mean to be American? And really the biggest thing we need to look at is that he, he starts to tease out this idea of the American dream. Okay. This is something we'll talk about a lot with American identity over the next couple of weeks. You know, what is the American dream? All right. Um, well, it's founded, as he says, in the principles of equal opportunity and self-determination. Okay. And that's pretty true. Like, he loses a war. You would think he'd get, you know, hightail it back to France. But there is a space for him in a would-be American colony in New York for him to go and buy a farm and kind of recreate a life. And... If that's a defining characteristic of the American dream is that we can constantly redefine ourselves as Americans and that there is equal opportunity or at least the semblance of equal opportunity if you work hard. So Krippercar helps establish this idea and his life is kind of working proof of that. Um, but once again, he has a leg up, right? He's super rich. So you know, his, his American dream of owning this gorgeous farm in uh, New York is probably different than ours today where we just kind of want to have a vacation, right? So, um, and, or a nicer car. So, you know, American dream obviously means different things to different people. We're going to kind of tease out in class what that means, and you're going to make a poster kind of portraying what you think it means. Um, but as we unpack this writing by Quebecois, keep all of these things in mind. Keep, keep in mind what's going on in the colonies and, and the newly developing the United States. Um, and yeah, uh, you know, enjoy his writing. It's a, it's a little intense, but overall, I think it's pretty good. All right. Thanks so much for watching.